We're going to turn to Psalm 100 uh, this morning, and I would uh, invite you to join me there. Just want to express my gratitude uh, to your pastor uh, for inviting us here. We talked about this several months ago, and uh, we were able to work it out so that we could tie this conference into Thanksgiving, and it gave us some extra incentive to be here, to be with our family over Thanksgiving, and we're just doubly grateful uh, to be uh, with family, but also to be here uh, ministering uh, with you here in this church. We're excited about what God's going to do throughout this week, and uh, just want to bring you greetings from Fundamental Baptist Church in St. John. We're very grateful for the work that the Lord is doing in our ministry, and any time we are away, which is not very often, uh, we do miss our folks uh, but it is uh, wonderful to be in a place uh, where God's word is revered and uh, where God's people are loving one another and you're seeking to share your faith. And I know uh, that is your heart's desire and that's just a joy to be in fellowship with you uh, this morning. We're going to read Psalm 100 here at the onset, just five verses, the short psalm that commonly is brought up, uh, particularly at times of Thanksgiving, like what we are celebrating uh, this weekend. And uh, so let's go ahead and read all five verses, and we'll take some time to see what the Lord would have to say to us. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. God, we're so grateful uh, for that last statement, that your truth endures to all generations. And we think of the psalmist who was led by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to pen these words in his generation. You are the same God today, and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we pray, Lord, that you will be exalted, that you will be uh, rejoiced over, uh, that we will uh, just bow in reverence uh, to your sovereignty, to your authority, that we would appreciate your goodness and your faithfulness and your mercy to us to a greater extent, Lord. And I pray that as you are seeking worshipers that would worship you in spirit and in truth, I pray that, that as we have this time around the word, that you would receive from us what it is that you desire, what it is that you deserve, that you will receive true worship from us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, many of us gathered yesterday uh, with family and friends, or maybe we'll do that today or perhaps tomorrow, uh, but this time of year, we get together as Canadians and celebrate this day that our government has set aside for us called Thanksgiving Day. This is a holiday that has been observed in this country for centuries unofficially. There are stories that date back to the 1600s of these kinds of observances and various forms being held across this land. But Thanksgiving, as we know it, became an officially sanctioned national holiday in 1879. It was actually not held back in, in October, back at that time. It was held in November. It was more recently, 1957, that the Governor General of Canada at that time, Vincent Massey, declared that Thanksgiving Day should be held annually on the second Monday of October. And he said this back then regarding this pronouncement. He said, a day of general thanksgiving to Almighty God for the bountiful harvest with which Canada has been blessed. It's hard to imagine any political leader today saying such things. But the celebration of a day like Thanksgiving does beg some important questions of us. What is Thanksgiving? What causes us to be thankful? And how do we give thanks? And to whom do we render our thanks? As a nation, I would submit that we are more confused about these questions than we have ever been. We all agree as a nation that it is good to give thanks. You don't actually have to be a Christian to believe that. You don't have to go to church to hear that. You can hear these things in a psychology magazine or a medical journal. They'll tell you it is good for you to give thanks. It will lower your blood pressure. It will make you a happier person. All of that, everyone agrees that we should give thanks. But how and why and to whom thanksgiving should be offered is a question that is just shrouded in confusion today. And our psalm really answers all of those questions for us. 
Psalm 100 is one of the most prominent calls to thanksgiving in the Bible. In fact, you may have a subtitle to this psalm that is given at the top of the writing of this actual psalm, or it might be entitled a psalm of thanksgiving or a psalm for giving thanks. That is the clear purpose of this psalm. It's a call to authentic thanksgiving. There are three questions about thanksgiving that are answered in Psalm 100. The questions of how we thank, who we are to thank, and why we should thank at all. Notice first, the answer to the question how comes in verses 1 and 2. And and we'll call this a call to glad thanksgiving. This is how God desires to be thanked and praised gladly, joyfully. This psalm has been nicknamed over the years the Jubilate, which is a word which means, oh, be joyful. And that title is based upon the first line of the psalm that says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Gladness and joyfulness is the clear theme of verses 1 and 2. What does glad thanksgiving sound like and what ought it to look like? First, what it sounds like is glad shouting. It's a glad shouting. That's the idea of the word noise in verse 1. The idea here is a shout. Thanksgiving ought to be a bit noisy. It's a a loud affair. And some of you might be getting nervous when I say that because you say we're not supposed to shout in church, are we? We're supposed to be quiet and pensive and controlled. There is a lot of noise that goes on and passes for Thanksgiving in church land today. I know good Christian people who are in churches that are so noisy that they sit out in the lobby during the singing time and then they enter in when the preaching begins. That's not the idea here. There's no value in noise in and of itself. This word noise has the idea in Hebrew of a shout. And it's a shout that loyal subjects might give when they are in the presence of their leader. When the king returns home from battle after a great victory, there's an expectation that there will be a throng of people that are lining the streets and they are just shouting for joy over his victory. That's the idea here. So we're not just talking about making noise. This is a shout of victory. This is something that we might be prompted to do when our team wins a game or our least favorite team loses. I've already decided that I'm going to avoid all Montreal Canadian jabs this week. I've got to try to stay on good terms with your pastor, and especially Ethan and Nathan. So so we'll try something else. Glad shouting might be how we would be inclined to respond when our kids or our grandkids do something great, perhaps graduating with honors. This is what you might hear people doing when their candidate gets elected. Or maybe when you get an awesome gift or you find something that you have lost, we would shout. And not all of us would actually verbally shout because we're more naturally reserved, but we at least feel that impulse to do so. As Christians, we ought to at least feel that impulse to shout in triumph. And why is that? It's because our God is a triumphant God. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He rules and reigns, and we share in his victory. Jesus Christ is the mighty conqueror. He has vanquished all of his foes. He has destroyed the works of the devil. Sin and death have forever been conquered. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's coming back for us, and we're going to rule and reign with him. This is our Savior, and when we come into his presence, we ought to want to shout in response. And we do so, the psalmist says, joyfully, gladly. In other words, We're not forced to do this. This is something that is spontaneous. We actually just want to do it. And this call for a glad style of worship is not just suggested here in Psalm 100, but it's littered really throughout the entire body of the book of Psalms. In fact, if you go back to the previous Psalms, you will see these themes mentioned over and over again. For instance, you might go back a page in your Bibles to Psalm 98, and notice Psalm 98 in verse 4 where it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Go back uh, another page to Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. We see this over and over that our praise to the Lord ought to be a joyful affair. 
I smiled over what one commentator said about this verse. He said, the joyful noise is not the special contribution of the tone deaf. You've heard this before. You know, Hank can't sing worth a lick, but he sure is happy doing it. He makes a joyful noise, right? Have you ever heard that? Sue can't carry a tune in the bucket, but she sure tries. And sometimes we say that. Just make a joyful noise if you can't sing. Writer went on to say the joyful noise is actually not the special contribution of the tone deaf but it's the equivalent in worship to the shout of fanfare to a king. And this is why our thanksgiving really needs to be glad and why it needs to be loud, because God is king. Jesus is the king of kings, and if we're in Christ this morning, we need to remind ourselves that we are on the winning side. We were lost at one time, but now we have been found. We were once dead in our sins and trespasses, but now we are alive. We were shackled, but now we are freed. And so our thanksgiving is glad. Charles Spurgeon said, our happy God should be worshipped by a happy people. And it's true. Were you glad this morning as you worshipped? Were, were you cheerful and were you happy as you sang the songs? And I'm not saying, did you skip into the service today like the cowboy singing, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being happy because... Not because everything is going for us right right now. Rather, it's in spite of what is going on around us. Have we realized that Jesus is still the conqueror? That everything in our lives is utter, under his complete and utter control? That since you are in Christ, that nothing will ever separate you from his love? Since all of these things are true of our God and of our Christ and are thus true of us as well, no matter how we feel or how we have performed this week or what's going on in the world, we can still come here and we can shout with our brothers and sisters in Christ and say, victory in Jesus. He's, he's my Savior forever. And that's the kind of thanksgiving that delights the heart of God, a glad thanksgiving. And it's, it's contagious. He says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye what? Lands. In other words, we want others to get in on this. We want to share this joy. We want others to know that Jesus is king. And that's really the significance of the noise here, the shout. Why would you shout? You don't need to shout to get God's attention because God is able to hear even the silent cries of our hearts. He hears when we sing in our hearts to him. So why shout? It's really for others to hear. Psalm 98 again says, make a loud noise. Why does it have to be loud? so that people even at a distance away from us can hear. And one day we know that every tongue will be confessing that Jesus is Lord and that the tongues of all the saints will be crying out eternally, worthy is the Lamb. But in the meantime, we gladly give thanks so that others might hear and join with us. This has always been the mission of God's people, not only to gladly worship ourselves, but to invite others to join. This is God's desire. Listen to this passage from Isaiah 56 and verse 6, where it says, Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in thy house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be accepted on mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The book of the Psalms, Psalm 150, the very last line in all of the Psalms goes this way. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And so our glad thanksgiving ought to be characterized by glad shouting. And notice in verse 2 we encounter glad serving. Verse 2 goes on to say, serve the Lord with gladness. This is a great word, serve. It speaks both to our worship and to our ministry. It encompasses both our vocal expressions, but also our entire lives. So it's what we do here corporately, yes, but it's also what we do all throughout the week. It's between the times that we actually come together as the people of God. We serve the Lord's with gladness. We do this as we study for a quiz or grade a paper or do a load of laundry or give a presentation or drive a nail or turn a wrench or whatever it happens to be. I was once a part of a church that when you entered in the driveway, it said, enter to worship. And then there was a sign that looked exactly the same on the exit, and it would say, it said, depart to serve. I liked that. 
All of life between our corporate expressions of thanksgiving is to be one glad offering of service with our mouths, with our hands, and with our feet. This is Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And this is your reasonable service. In other words, we do this gladly. And and why do we offer our lives gladly? Well, if at any point you used to serve Satan, you know why. If you used to serve sin in yourself, and we all did at one time, you know. Why? What did Jesus say? He said, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. There was a time, Ephesians 2 says, when we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and that was a hard life. Sin was no easy master. The way of the transgressor is hard. Satan is a cruel Lord. And if we have been delivered from all of that, and now we have the privilege of serving the king, how can we help but do so gladly? It is no duty to serve the king of kings. There's an Isaac Watts hymn. It's not overly popular, but it's in our hymn book. I think it's in yours as well. But it says, my master and my Lord, my conqueror and my king, thy scepter and thy sword, thy reigning grace I sing. Thine is the power. And listen to this. He says, behold, I sit in willing bonds or willing shackles beneath thy feet. Our bonds are willing bonds. In other words, no one is making us serve God. We do this willingly. And after all that he has done for us, how can we do anything less? The love of Christ constrains us to serve him. We need to hear this from time to time because our Christianity can sometimes become somewhat dutiful and mechanical if we're not mindful of these things. And some of us may have gotten a bit crusty or maybe even a bit grumpy in our service for the Lord. And maybe we're doing a lot of things because we have to and we know that we're supposed to. And maybe other people expect us to do them, but perhaps we've lost our joy. I want to say along with the psalmist, folks, that there is no better life than the life serving the Lord. Have we forgotten who we used to serve? Have we forgotten the destruction of our sin? Have we forgotten the hell to which we were once headed? Have we forgotten what a cruel master that sin and Satan really are? Listen, if we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, let's serve the Lord with gladness. And this is how we show our thanks to the Lord, with glad service. Glad shouting, glad service. And then thirdly, at the end of verse 2, our glad thanksgiving is characterized by glad singing. In verse 2 says, come before his presence with singing. And here we are, back to our worship together as the people of God. He says, come. And if you're here today, you've already got that part down. You came. Keep coming. Come more. But did you come with singing? And I don't mean by that, did you mouth the words that are in the hymn book? Did you actually sing? Did you actually think that you were coming before the presence of God with this throng of worshipers, and did you sing to him? Did you even pay attention to the words that you sang? One of the most reiterated commands in the Bible is this. It's sing. God's people should just want to do this. It ought to be automatic. And you, if you don't sing, and you don't want to sing, and you can't even figure out why other people around you are singing, you might ask yourself the question, why is that? I've been to places where I don't sing. I've been to sports games where the home crowd is singing a song that I don't know, or maybe I don't even agree with it because I'm going for the visiting team. And again, still no Montreal jokes. I've been to events where the crowd is singing and dancing to songs that grieve my spirit, and I can't join in that. I used to. If we have no desire to sing with God's people, why is that? And could it be that we actually don't possess what others have that are causing them to sing? In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says this about Christian singing. He says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but rather be filled with the Spirit. And what will be the overflow of the Spirit's work in our life? We speak to one another, Paul says, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. If you have liquor in you, you will overflow in excessive behavior. But if you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, you will overflow in glad singing. You just will. If you're not coming here singing gladly, I understand that all of us may have a Sunday where we have bad breath or maybe we have a sickness or something and you just need to stand and listen. But if you have no desire to sing, you might question whether God's spirit has been quenched in you by sin or whether he's even there at all. 
Because the truth is, if we are filled with the Spirit, that is, if we are controlled by the Spirit, who indeed dwells us after we trust in Christ, the overflow of that is expressions of worship and praise. And if you are able, it ought to be audible. You won't be able to stay silent. Proverbs 29 and verse 6 says, The righteous doth sing and rejoice. We just do. In another Isaac Watts hymn, we're marching to Zion. He said, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. You don't know God, why would you sing to him? Nothing to sing about. But, he says, children of the heavenly king, we must, we must speak our joys abroad. We have to. There's no other way to express our gladness about being saved and serving the king of kings than by our singing. Janice and I were reading this verse the other night, and then I saw it in your bulletin. I think it's a memory verse for you this month. Hebrews 13 and verse 15. By him, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The repeated call of the word to us is to engage in glad thanksgivings. And so this is how we give thanks. We give thanks gladly, with glad shouting and glad serving and glad singing. And then verse 3 gives us the answer to the question, who? And we'll call this a God word. Thanksgiving, a call to Godward Thanksgiving. Who is it that we thank? We thank God, the giver of all good gifts. Notice verse 3. It says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Thanksgiving, if it is Thanksgiving at all, must be an informed Thanksgiving. We need to know who it is that we thank. Interestingly, I came across an article recently that rebuked a certain Christian musician for using songs that you couldn't tell whether she was singing to God or to her boyfriend. And this has been an issue in the Christian music world for years. Many, in an effort to gain a wider audience to sell a few more albums, have been rather ambiguous about who it is that they worship. Songs that could apply to God, but could also apply to other people. The psalmist is not ambiguous at all here, is he? I think I counted up 16 times in these five verses. You have this title, Lord, or God, or He, or His, or Him. Folks, God alone is to be the target of our worship. It's not about us at all. It's about Him. These three truths in verse 3, we must know about our God in order to worship Him rightly. First that we need to know is that the Lord is God. That's what he says in verse 3. And that would seem to be a no-brainer. But that's not even necessarily true even in those that make up the church today. Some of you may have heard a few years ago that the largest Protestant denomination in our country, the United Church of Canada, their governing body made a historic decision to reinstate the pastor of the West Hill United Church of Toronto. And what was historic about the decision is that their minister is an avowed atheist. She doesn't even believe God exists. And if you go to her church's website, It says that they claim to welcome theists, atheists, and agnostics as legitimate worshipers of God. And the motto of their church is, it's a progressive spiritual community where how you live is more important than what you believe. Maybe you could use that one, Pastor Luke. But folks, the Lord alone is God. He alone is worthy of worship. Hear, O Israel, he says in Deuteronomy 6, the Lord our God is one Lord. Isaiah 42 and verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another. Folks, the Lord is God alone. Secondly, we need to know that the Lord is creator. So he goes on in the middle of verse 3 to say, it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. What does this say? Thanksgiving is rooted in the knowledge that it is only by his doing that we even exist. We wouldn't even be here without him. And if we don't recognize this, we can never be truly thankful. That's really what's perplexing about a national holiday like Thanksgiving. The majority of the people that are meeting and gathering for Thanksgiving, they're going to try to be thankful, and yet they refuse to acknowledge that God even exists or that God created them. They'll enjoy his gifts of life and food and yet not even acknowledge that he is there. This is the product of years and years of evolutionary teaching that has just become mainstream in our society. This theory that we didn't need God in order to come into being. And so we really have no one to thank for what we have other than ourselves, maybe our ancestors. And this is the essence of idolatry. We have flipped everything upside down. God makes us in order to thank him, and we make our own gods, and then we worship ourselves. What are we doing? If you go to Romans chapter 1 and see this society that is totally plummeted into destruction, At the very root, it says they were not thankful. 
That's the root of it all. And in order to properly thank, we need to know that the Lord is God and that he is our creator. And then the third truth in verse 3 is that the Lord is our redeemer. We need to know this as well. And this deserves a whole message in itself. And we're going to do that tonight when we look at Psalm 32. But we are his people. We are his sheep. And how did that happen? The Lord is God to all people. He is the creator of all people. We're all his in that sense. And yet not all acknowledge him as the God and creator that he is, and neither do they thank him. And that was us too at one time, wasn't it? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him, that is on Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. The God and creator of all took on flesh and came to this world that had rejected him to redeem a special people for himself. A sheepfold. Jesus said, John 10 and verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That's us, the redeemed ones. First Peter 2.10 reminds us that we in time past were not a people, but now we're the people of God. We had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. We're not here today to boast because we have saved ourselves. We never could do that. We're here thanking him because he has redeemed us. Psalm 79 and verse 13, we say along with the psalmist there, so we thy people, the sheep of thy pasture, will give thanks to thee forever. And we will. It's amazing if you turn to the book of Revelation, and we won't right now, but Revelation 4, Revelation 7, they both indicate that the saints will be rendering thanks, giving to God forever and ever. All the credit for all who are saved for all of eternity will be given to the Lamb of God. And so how do we give thanks. We give thanks gladly with glad shouting, glad serving, and glad singing. Who is it that we thank? We thank our God, the one God, the creator God, the redeemer God. Finally, why do we give thanks? We'll call this a call to grateful thanksgiving, a call to grateful thanksgiving. Verse 4 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, be thankful unto him, bless his name. You've probably been invited to someone's house before, and most often you very politely will ask this person, what can I bring? This probably is happening this weekend, even as you gather to feast with your family and friends, you would ask your host, what should I bring? And sometimes the host will say something like, bring a dessert or bring a side. If, a, a side. if you come to our house, you can bring dessert. You can bring the whole meal if you want to. Or the host might say, don't bring anything, just bring yourselves. What does God say? What should I bring, God, when I enter into your presence? And God says, bring thanksgiving. Bring me praise. That's, that's all I want. And why? Because everything that needs to be done has already been done. There's nothing left to do. I mean, what did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. The debt of our sin has been completely paid so that we can just enter into the presence of God. The anger of God towards our sin and rebellion has been fully satisfied. Jesus Christ has given his life as a sacrifice for the sheep. The work of salvation is done. We enter into the courts of God on the efforts of Christ alone. We can't add anything to the meal. We certainly can't come with our works. They're not necessary. We simply partake of the salvation that God has provided and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. The end of verse 4 again says, be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why? There's three reasons to gratefully thank God at the end of Verse 5, and we'll close with this, letter A, thank God because he is good. Verse 5 says, for the Lord is good. Do you believe that? Psalm 34 and verse 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 84, 11, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. James 1 and verse 17, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. He is so good. And secondly, thank God that he is merciful. His merciful is, in fact, everlasting, the psalmist says, God said through Moses in Exodus 34 and verse 6, the Lord God merciful and gracious. Psalm 103 and verse 8 will say he is slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. Got to be thankful for that as mercy is our only hope of ever being delivered from sin's condemnation. And finally, thank God that he is faithful. Verse 5 says his truth endures to all generations. Every generation changes, doesn't it? But God never changes. What he has been, he always will be. The God that the psalmist thanked so many years ago for these very reasons is the God that we thank today for the very same reasons. All that he is, he always will be. His truth will always 
remain. So many older folks have said this to me in recent days, and I get why they say it. It probably happens here too, but people will often say, I'm just so glad I don't have to raise kids in this generation. Talk about a very hopeless thing to say to parents in this generation. Have any parents heard that kind of sentiment lately? I'm just so glad I don't have to be you raising kids today. And some of us are concerned for the generation coming up. Some of us are worried for our kids and grandkids because of the new and multifaceted temptations that are coming their way, issues that we did not have to face. But folks, if God is good and is mercy and truth and doer to all generations, we're all going to be fine. Martin Luther wrote this in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress. He said, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. Doesn't that not sound like our world? It was Martin Luther's world, apparently, and it's our world today. It's the world in which our kids are growing up. But he says, we will not fear. And why? For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. And if we have his truth, and we all have his truth, we're going to be fine. So let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may even kill. But God's truth abideth still. And it always will. It did in your generation, senior citizen. It has in your generation, those of a middle age, it has in your generation, young mom and dad, single adult and young person, it will still be abiding in your generation and even the generation after you. So we're going to be okay. So be thankful. And how should we be thankful? We should be glad in our thanksgiving. Glad shouting, glad serving, glad singing. Do this with joy. And to whom? To God our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer. And why? Because we are grateful to God forever for his goodness and his mercy and his truth. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. I'm going to let Pastor Luke close the service how he sees fit in a moment. But before he comes, let me just urge you to reflect on what you have heard. Maybe you are not thankful today. You have no desire to sing or praise the Lord, Lord, and you know it. And perhaps you know it is because you're not actually a child of God. You've never truly been born again. You're still bound in your sins. I just want to encourage you today that you can be set free. If you will trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God loves you so much. That he sent Jesus to die for your sins, to spare you from hell, and to grant you eternal life in heaven. I wonder this morning, is there anyone here today? And you'd say, I'm not sure Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but I want him to be. I recognize that I'm a sinful person, and that my only hope is to cast myself on the mercy of God. If that's you saying that in your heart right now, would you just lift your hand? Only me and Pastor Luke are looking. We'd just like to help you afterwards in any way that we can. Is there anyone that would say, I know that I'm still in my sins, but I'm casting myself on the mercy of God. I want the salvation that Jesus came to give. Would you just lift your hand? Thank you very much. Maybe you've lost your joy and you've gotten a bit discouraged. Maybe you have allowed sin in your life and it's wrecking your thankful spirit and you know it's true. You're convicted about that. And you have some things to confess and forsake and you just need to say to God this morning, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Thank you for your goodness and mercy and truth. Just take a moment to do that and then Pastor Luke will come and close us in a moment.